I'll start by welcoming all of you, the participants, the panelists, to this second panel discussion in our series of online events on design approaches for current and future HIV prevention efficacy trial. Today, we continue the discussion that we started on the 27th of October with the lesson learned from current design. Um, I'm going to now hand over to Veronica Miller, one of the co-organizer of this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Hi, um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Veronica Miller. I'm the director of the Forum for Collaborative Research based out of University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. We have an amazing panel with us today, and we really look forward to the discussion to follow up on the discussion we started on October 27th. We have Mike Robertson from Merck. Mike, do you want to just say if uh, five to 10 words about your position at Merck? Sure, thank you, Veronica. So um, I'm Mike Robertson at Merck, as Veronica said, and I lead our uh, product development team for um, our HIV prevention program. Wonderful to have you here. Next on my screen, I see David Glidden from UCSF. Same with you, David, just five to 10 words. Good morning, I'm Dave Glidden from UCSF. I'm a professor of biostatistics there with a deep interest in HIV prevention design. Great, Jeremy Sugarman. Yeah, hi, Jeremy Sugarman, a physician and bioethicist from the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins. And I've been the longstanding chair of the and ethics working group. Wonderful. We have Deborah Donnell. Hi, I am also um, a biostatistician like Dave Glidden. I work at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, and I've been working with the HPTN, HIV Prevention Trials Network, for many years in, in HIV prevention. Wonderful. And Sheila McCormick from London. Hi there. I am the uh, clinician and um, Trialist, I guess, at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL, working on HIV prevention trials for many years, too. We have Tamban Valapil uh, from the F US FDA. Hi, good morning. Uh, Tamban Valapil, a biostatistician uh, working for the US FDA and involved with antiviral drugs, including Wonderful. HIV. Wonderful to have you here with us today. We also have Grace Kumwenda. Hi, my name is Grace Kwenda. I'm an HIV prevention advocate based in Malawi, Africa. I'm passionate about PrEP, women's health, and HIV clinical trials. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. And we also have Holly James, also from the University of Washington, who is one of the organizers uh, for this series of, of meetings. So nice to have you on as well, Holly. So I will now hand it back to Deborah. Donnell to give us a summary of the presentations that we all have listened to in preparation for today's discussion. Deborah, please go ahead. Thank you very much, um, Veronica, and good morning, afternoon, and evening. I know we have people on from all over the world. Um, this is the first of three panels to discuss trial designs in specific HIV prevention domains. So one today we're talking about trial designs for ARV-based prevention what we commonly call PrEP. We have two future panels. They're gonna look separately at issues for vaccines and for broadly neutralizing antibodies since their situation is slightly different. But today we're discussing trial design approaches to get approval for new ARV-based ARV prevention. And it's a situation where we already have multiple products that are effective and they're effective to the point where the number of HIV infections we observe in people on these products is pretty small. So we have this really strong proof of concept that ARV-based prevention is usually effective. Um, and we're in a context where powering a traditional randomized clinical trial, whether it's superiority or non-inferiority, is gonna take time, would take time and resources that we believe are currently out of reach. So we have these six talks discussing different approaches. Jared Baton talked about first the need, the need for all of these different tools. Um, but more specifically about the potential contribution we could get from tracking STI incidents as a marker of ongoing sexual risk and pointing out the risk that that STI might not track HIV risk in the populations as prevention and treatment for HIV start to affect the epidemic and the clinical trial participants. 
Edward and Sinead talked about what's a new idea for HIV prevention trials, which is using cross-sectional HIV incidence measures. I believe this is a promising idea, but it's clear from these somewhat more technical talks that it's not without complexity. So um, cross-sectional incidence does give you a direct measure of HIV incidence within the communities where we're enrolling. Sinead talked about the practical aspects of how we would have to change our implementation to do cross-sectional incidence and the critical importance of stakeholder engagement in that effort. Edward gave a very nice, much more technical talk, that's why we have so many biased decisions on the panel, on the measurement issues with the use of zero incidence assays. I thought it was really enlightening to see work from another field, from new, new I can't say it, from unicocal vaccines from David Radley. Um, this is clearly relevant to potential future approaches for vaccines and perhaps monoclonal antibodies. It's important to note that that approach was rooted in these initial trials with really high efficacy in the, in the first versions of the vaccine. The last two talks then turned to the potential for math modeling approaches to estimate HIV incidence. And we saw two different, really different approaches. Mia Moore talked about a very detailed con context specific approach in women living in a high risk context in, in Africa. And Jeff Eaton gave a, talked about sort of a broader population based synthesis of data with some small area adaptation um, issues, uh, uh, approaches. So when we go into this panel, we have these six talks talking about approaches. In addition, we're gonna be talking about some of the approaches discussed in the last panel that are currently being used, used to estimate this counterfactual um, placebo based on registrational cohorts or other data. So the point of this discussion is to uncover, to, to talk about the reality of those ideas or uncover potentially new ideas or approaches that could be promising. So we're gonna head into this panel with all these multiple ideas, mostly centering around the idea of counterfactual placebo, different methods for doing that. And I'll be interested to hear from our panelists today, all these different perspectives on new ideas for moving forward with ARV-based prevention. So back to you, Veronica. Thank you, Deborah. So we will um, we will run this panel in a in an interactive way as much as possible. I will start off by asking some uh, questions to each of you, but uh, towards the end, we would really like to also have you interact with each other. And of course, we really look forward to getting some questions from the attendees that you can put into the Q and A box so that we can also deal with those questions as a panel. So let's start with uh, the, um, the first question. So the, um, so we basically have to find approaches that will be very convincing for payers, policies, and people who use it if they have to, if they're um, going to have both scientific and phase validity. So that means that although maybe some of these um, entities, uh, payers, policymakers, and people that use them might have different criteria, in the end, all three of them, all three of those groups of people really need to be convinced that this, this, new, um, that this new intervention is going to work. And you know, we know everyone is really well trained in the idea of a randomized controlled trial. And once we start talking about using external controls, um, including ideas like a counterfactual placebo, people start saying, well, this is not quite what we are used to doing. And will that really give us a result we can trust in? So what are the main risks barriers you're experiencing with advancing these ideas? I'd like to start with Mike, and just to give up the head, heads up to Jeremy and Grace after. So let's start with Mike. Thanks, thanks Veronica, and um, thanks Deb for that nice summary of the, the um, videos that uh, were available for, for reviewing. I think all of us in the field are, of HIV prevention um, recognize that there are challenges bringing new products forward. And I think uh, a lot of the, the things that were summarized in the videos highlight what those challenges are. Um, I think as a, you know, I work for um, an industry sponsor. Uh, we're very interested in new prevention methods. And I think the things that are challenging for us are that um, 
we want to know, you know, if we conduct these large trials and, and these require a very large investment and take a lot of time, um, you know, are the, you know, really, I, I think you summarized it well, Veronica, there's one element of making sure that the trials that we conduct are sufficient to get regulatory approval for the product. I mean, that's key. You know, the product can't be made available unless health authorities approve it. But I think even beyond that, um, we need to make sure that we generate sufficient data so that when people, you know, consider using this product or recommending this product, if you're a policymaker, or reimbursing for this product, you know, how, however that's done, that those data are sufficient to say that this is actually a useful product. So I think we want to, um, you know, look very carefully at these new methods. We're all used to the kind of the more traditional methods where uh, we've been working, you know, with, um, you know, either placebo controlled trials or non-inferiority or superiority trials to an active comparator. And I think people are pretty comfortable with that. But these new approaches, while they may help um, accelerate the pipeline and bring new products forward that might otherwise be challenging to do, I think we wanna make sure that people will actually be convinced when we actually generate the data. So we do these large trials, we spend you know, lots of money and take lots of time to do it. We wanna make sure people will actually use the product when it's completed. So I think that's the kind of thing that we all want to be um, sure of. I mean, you always know when you conduct a trial that the trial could fail. We can live with that. But if the trial is, quote, successful, you know, based on these new criteria, we also want to make sure that people are convinced that the data uh, really do demonstrate this. So I think that's probably the biggest hurdle that, that we faced as a, as a sponsor thinking about conducting these trials. Right. Thank you, Mike, for that insight. Jeremy, from your perspective, what are the biggest risks? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So Michael and raised a lot of good points here. I think the, the videos were quite good and compelling in terms of laying out the problem and some potential ideas for, for how, uh, solving it. Um, even without subtitles, the message, uh, I don't, I'm not really fluent in biostatistics, but I, I speak a little bit just enough to get myself in trouble. Um, but I think, I think the videos were good in terms of, of laying out the problem and no one really had the secret sauce yet to say that we're convinced that this is the best way to go. From an ethics matter, and we're rolling um, participants in a trial testing a new intervention, we have to start, the starting point ethically is that the science is, is sound. It has to be sound as, a, as the first principle. And if the science isn't sound, if we don't think that that trial is gonna be informative, it doesn't matter if it's a positive trial or a negative trial, it just has to be informative that we learn from that trial. We can't learn from that trial and be confident with what we're learning, it's unethical to go forward. And there's been a long history in, in medicine and science in general that have pushed us towards doing RCTs uh, wherever possible and using good controls where, uh, wherever possible. And I think we need to be humbled by that. And when we've diverted our um, efforts in other times during the history of the HIV epidemic, we also know that we've been fooled about lessons from, say, early antiretroviral trials using secondary outcome measures. So um, it, not a lot of lots changed in the field and in the epidemic, but we really need to be um, humbled um, by that history. Whenever we think of a control group uh, going forward, we're going to have to have clinical equipoise um, between whatever that arm is and whatever the comparator is, whether that comparator is a placebo or something else, uh, an active control. We need to have clinical equipoise where the scientific community and the user community is divided on data to point about whether there's safety and efficacy is it, is it legitimate to randomize when we're doing a randomized trial. So start with great science and until we have sort of alternatives to great science, I think we have to be super cautious about introducing um, new methods. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Grace. Thank you so much. And let me say it's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, I think for communities, uh, before we even talk about the barriers and the challenges, I think one angle for us is also to look at the opportunities. The opportunities that talking about novel designs is actually bringing us. Um, at the moment, as communities, we are at a very exciting moment, as probably everyone else is. We are looking at a future where the there is an, a potential to expand the prevention toolbox to that we have. We are looking at the potential of having oral pills. We are looking at the potential of having the vaginal ring in the next few years and possibly an injectable prep in the future. So our conversation when talking about uh, 
novel designs is also starting with what opportunities actually exist. However, to go back to the issue of what are the biggest challenges for communities, I think for us, it's also research literacy. It has taken a lot of years to get us where we are as communities, to learn about phase one, phase two, phase three trials, to understand about random control trials, placebo controlled uh, uh, trials. So to get us where we are, it's been a lot of learning for communities, a lot of learning for advocates. So at the moment, as we are starting to talk about novel designs, it will also take us to step up, to start talking about how do we translate the language that is coming in right now? How do we start talking about counterfactual to communities? How do we start talking about external controls? And how do we explain it to our communities? So research literacy is going to be quite a big issue moving forward. And one of the challenges would be not clearly coming up with strategies of communicating uh, th those, uh, those strategies of engaging in research literacy. And mind you, where communities are concerned in this case, it's not just about HIV advocates, it's not just about communities. We also have to talk about HIV program leaders in different countries. We also have to talk about uh, media that have been part of this journey. How do we translate all this to these different types of stakeholders? And at the same time, as we're looking at all these um, as we're looking at all these issues, uh, one of the issues that we need to look at is this conversation need to include communities from point go. We are excited that we've been part of this conversation. And I think a mistake would be to say, let's focus on regulators, let's focus on um, uh, scientists. I think communities need to be engaged from point go. And I think so far it's been part of an exciting journey. And moving forward, it's how do we expand this kind of conversation to the rest of the communities and how do we design that research literacy? I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that has given us um, a good um, initial foray into this topic in terms of, of the risks that, that people see. And it's of course very important that we, we keep these in mind as we move forward because as we, as we heard, um, we can't expect people to invest a lot of resources in doing some of these trials nor patients to participate if, um, if in the end people are not going to believe the results. So that's why it's so extremely important to have the um, you know, to, to have this convincing part that is so important to, to everyone. So now let's talk a little bit about the counterfactual placebo approach, which we can think of in different ways using cross sectional incidence assays or otherwise to have an idea of what's actually going on in the community where people are being recruited from uh, to a clinical trial. So when we think, when you think specifically, David, about the counterfactual placebo, what, what comes to your mind? What keeps you up at night? So uh, what first comes to mind is the opportunities that they may present. So I wanna go a little bit off what Grace talked about. Mm -hmm. I've been influenced by being involved in HIV treatment guidelines and the abundance of options in HIV treatment is quite striking would really love to see a time when we have abundant options customized for people's situations for HIV prevention. So the hope is that the placebo-based approach will allow us to test more possible ARV-based concepts for PrEP. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with the opportunities. The things that concern me is that to date, we don't have an unambiguous way to do that. We have a variety of ways to do that. They have a variety of strengths and weaknesses. Again, off mic and off grace, persuasiveness is key. So whatever we do, it should be something that's convincing not only to regulators, but all the way down to potential users. People may remember the robust discussion that took place about HIV prep for MSM and transgender women and a great deal of interest in the community about how persuasive or how protective they mm -hmm. believe these products to be. A final issue that concerns me is that um, people like me, the people like Deb, can 
think about uh, ideas for ways that we might calculate counterfactuals, but it requires an important dialogue with trialists to make sure that it may require shifting how we do the trials. Sinead mm -hmm. covered this and kind of that connect that we hand over and can operationally realize the potential of these approaches. Right. Let me go to you, Tamban. Let's hear from, from your side of the world at the FDA. What do you see are the biggest risks? And, you know, as we have all been doing, also the opportunities. What are the opportunities, but also risks that you're concerned about, Tamban, uh, when we talk about a placebo, a counterfactual plus placebo? Hi, Veronica. Thank you for the question. And I think if I may just step back a little bit, as uh, Mike said, you know, the ideally, so it has to be an adequate and well-controlled trial where the evidence should be collected and, uh, you know, either a placebo control trial or an active control superiority trial. But then in the current situation, uh, what we have seen is it's probably difficult to do a placebo control trial. So that's where uh, we are thinking about the external control, you know, whether it's a recency assay or other external controls. So the concern is, uh, you know, if you don't have a placebo in the current trial, how good, how, how reliable the external control is in terms of establishing similar effect size or you know, similar reliability of treatment effect. So that's a big question. So we have to make sure that uh, it, you know, there aren't much of an uncertainty when we use external control, it has to be recent enough. It's essentially replacing the placebo from the concurrent, you know, which, which could be used as a concurrent control. Um, however, we still need to have some level of control data in the trial. You know, the question is, well, how do you test it? Whether would you test it for superiority or non inferior That's a relevant, you know, I mean, I understand there are sample size implications, but nonetheless, we need to have some control data to establish internal consistency and also validate what the external placebo is telling us. Right. So the main points were that are that your concern is that the external control be as similar and contemporaneous with the population that joins the trial as possible. And so I think sometimes people, when they think external control, automatically think historical control, which in some cases it is, but we're really, uh, so your point really is it needs to be a concurrent external control that that makes a valid and you also speak to the point of still having an internal control such as for example having a standard of care that you compare with the new intervention just to have that internal control that that both interventions if they're different from the placebo external counterfactual are indeed working right 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 mike from your perspective how do you see yeah. the, the difference between um, the, the two? So if the, you know, how big do you think the difference needs to be if the external counterfactual placebo has, let's just make up a number, has an incidence of let's say 4.8% within the community that's relatively similar to what's being enrolled in the trial. And the trial has very few transmissions, so a very low incidence rate. Would that be convincing to you to go to your management at the company and say, this is the way to go? It's a very key question, Veronica, I think, you know, and I think we as a field are, are trying to help define how to move this forward. I think that um, I really look at this as two very fundamental challenges with this new approach. I think one is the, um, the actual methodology itself for how you, you estimate this, this background rate. And I think it's, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that we're building on a lot of experience um, that's been done from the epidemiology field and from the policy field where um, trying to um, understand what the instance rate is in various communities. There's been a lot of work on this over the last more than a decade. So a lot of the methodology um, that we can build upon has been um, you know, tested and developed over the years. And I think 
if you watch the videos, I mean, when uh, you know, I watched Edward's video, um, you realize what an enormous amount of work has been going on in this. But you also realize how how challenging that is. And and you know, I think we always have to recognize that when we're estimating these rates, they are estimates. And I think um, you know, there are a number of things that can confound that, a number of ways that you have to understand that. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we have to understand that these really are estimates. I think what is really helpful, um, both that the IAS is doing and, and also Veronica with the forum is doing, I think we need to come together as a research community so that we're all aligned on the approaches that we're taking so that we're, we, you know, there is a consensus around the proper methodology that, that we should use and we should, you know, all build upon that. So I think the methodological parts are, are, are daunting, but not insurmountable. And I think the operational aspects of this are also quite daunting. And I think, again, Sinead did a wonderful job in the video um, talking about some of the operational challenges of this. We may have to change the way we do some of the trials, you know, because um, I think Sinead highlighted the, the, the way that we've been trying to do HIV prevention trials in the past is where we pre-screen people and only bring people into the trial if we know that they're not infected. But if we're going to use any of these estimates based on recency assays or, or mm -hmm. other methodologies, we actually need those data in the trial. So right. we have to kind of change the approach that we're, we're taking. And even then there's challenges like, do you take people that are already on existing daily prep? Do you count them in that? Because their incidents may not really reflect people that aren't on PrEP. And there's always, I think, the challenge that um, when we're looking at any kind of estimate, whether that's uh, using a recency assay, whether that's using surveillance data, um, whatever, um, we're looking, you know, those data look backwards. They look at what happened in the near past, but the trial itself is going forward. And I think some of the things that were also highlighted there, do you continue that surveillance through the trial? Do you continue doing it? I think some of these uh, things that Sheena probably will talk about, where do you have a, another kind of um, uh, cohort or another you know, uh, run-in kind of thing that you can use? Those are all very interesting, but they're also very challenging to implement from an operational standpoint. So I think that, Again, it's great that we're having these types of uh, sessions, trying to, as a, as a research community, to develop uh, methodologies. But I think we also have to realize that, um, you know, there are limitations for, for these sort of things. But, but I think we have to do that if we're going to keep, keep moving forward. So I think, um, again, those are the things that I really worry about are kind of methodological methods mm -hmm. and operational methods. Um, right. and, and those are both very, very important difficult challenges um, that we have to make sure we, we address. Right, and it really points to the fact that um, not only do we need the community, as Grace um, already mentioned, involved in the planning of this, but also it becomes a trial that is not just a trial for participants that are enrolled in a trial, it really becomes a trial that is embedded in a community where the whole community is contributing to the outcome of the trial. So it's a different approach. And the, um, you know, how, you know, how do we then in, talk to the people that really provide the evidence of the counterfactual placebo, but they're not really part of the trial, but yet they're contributing such important information. So I think uh, that really highlights again, the very important aspect of including the whole community in, in these discussions, not just those that might participate in the trial itself. But you mentioned registrational cohorts and let me go to Sheena now and ask her to comment on that. I know we have some questions coming in and we will get to those, but I wanted to give Sheena an opportunity to talk. What do you think, uh, maybe just kind of explain very briefly, what is a registrational cohort and why do you think that's an approach we should also be considering. Uh, thank you. And because in case I forget to say, the videos were wonderful. So thank you to all the presenters for those. They really were fab. Um, so I think um, a, a registration cohort would be a population, a study that you set up in, a, in advance of your trial 
because getting a trial set up in the field takes a long time. You have to get approvals of the protocol, much more complicated than simply doing a study where you're perhaps monitoring STIs, HIV. But it also gives you the opportunity that Grace spoke to, to really engage your community in what you're trying to do. And if you're trying to do something a little bit more complicated, and I do think it's more complicated to explain what the results really mean when you've got an active comparator, um, then this is an opportunity to do all of those things. And you end up with a, a sort of same time, same place, same population group that you can, that you can use for your counterfactual. Um, and it and it's kind of real. So there's there's no modeling in this, there's 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 no manipulation, it, it's real data. So I, I guess I, I that's a simple way of looking at it, but I think it's it, it it's a, it's a, it's very valuable and easier in some ways to then explain it uh, to everybody, I think. And uh, there are a couple of um, examples. I mean, we're doing it and, and Eugene Rizagira spoke of this in the PrepVac study. So you could go back and look at his video, which explains uh, what's happening there. We will continue to follow up people who for whatever reason do not go into the trial. So they will still be benefiting from being part of the research, even though they choose for whatever reason not to go into the study or are not eligible to do so. Um, and, um, the other setting that I'm familiar with in the clinic uh, situation in the UK, where we have a very large network of sexual health clinics reporting in um, every uh, year, every quarter to our national surveillance uh, center, the number of tests done, the number of diagnoses made, you've got that background, same, uh, same population, same mm -hmm. time, against which to measure if you're recruiting from a trial in that context. And I'm sure we're not unique, but, uh, but that certainly is a, a, a setting where you have very useful data to use as a uh, contextual. Right, right, right. And that actually is a perfect segue to the question that came in from uh, Sheila Kanslein, uh, Kansime, sorry. And she asks that we're talking about using multiple options to estimate the counterfactual placebo uh, based on the videos and the discussion now, SDIs, previous cohorts, incidence assays, et cetera, and estimating e efficacy of new interventions. So she asks, could we really think about estimating efficacy of new interventions considering various placebo rates on a scale? This, I think, would provide more robust results than just trying to find one accurate method. And um, I know we have often in our discussions emphasized that we need to, um, you know, we can increase the persuasiveness of what we're doing by having several ways to kind of say, yes, this, this estimate of the incidence rate is in the right ballpark by using additional things to the count, to the recency assay, for example. But let's uh, discuss this question that, um, that we have on our platform here. And maybe Deborah, let me take the liberty of going to you. And what do you think about this idea of having a scale depending on which estimate you use versus sort of aggregating all the estimates into one? I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think in principle, um, having to like the, the risk of having to choose this way of having a counterfactual versus that way of a counterfactual is is very high. For um, Mike, when he goes to his management, it's like we're doing you know we're we're doing um, cross sectional incidents and we're putting all our eggs in that particular basket. Um, I think if he had that plus uh, examining SDIs plus a counterfactual from other historical data or contemporaneous data, I think it's very likely that, that you, you have slightly more roots to the, to the bank. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think some of course require significant resources. So a registrational cohort is never gonna be free. Um, the cross-sectional incidence assay um, also brings with additional operational costs. So I, I think you know some ways of combining things um, come pretty much in the course of a trial and would not would not take additional resources. 
Um, I think if you were doing both a registrational cohort and cross-sectional incidence essays, that might be more than what people were taking on. But I think in principle, the idea that when you're trying something new, um, with a, when you're trying something new and you know there are complex issues in the measurement of the counterfactual placebo, I, I think um, spreading the risk or um, wanting um, for the future to have multiple stra strains of evidence is, is, a, is, a very, uh, is a very is a very sensible strategy. I, I do think um, a, one regulatory issue that comes to my mind immediately is that um, typically when you're doing a registrational trial, you have to pick one primary endpoint. So whether the FDA has any way of incorporating multiple strands of evidence with slightly different ways of measuring counterfactual would be an interesting um, question to have conversation on. Right. Um, thank you. Uh, this thank is you. Mike Verona. If, if I can also speak to that, I think, Deb, that's a critical point that you raised. I think having these multiple um, avenues, to, you know, you know, I kind of think of this as the totality of the data showing, mm -hmm. you know, that, and what you hope is that they all kind of point in the same direction. You know, uh, you also run the risk that, you know, one may suggest one thing and another may suggest another. I do think from a registrational standpoint, you have to kind of say, how do we declare this a success or not a success? I think you have to be willing to say, this is what I'm banking on. I think these other other methods, having multiple methods provides really important supporting data that may, you know, so again, I think there's two different issues. One is getting registration of a product. Another is actually uh, providing convincing evidence to people that actually are going to use the product and people that are going to recommend the product. And so I think having multiple uh, methods to support that is a really, really important and, and useful thing to do. But I do think we have to kind of think about it, you know, from a registrational standpoint, and I'd be very interesting to hear what Hamlet has to say about that. I think at some point you have to say, this is how we declare success or we don't dec declare success. Now, again, there may be times when you theoretically could miss on a primary endpoint, but then you have a lot of additional data to suggest that maybe there were some confoundings that, that maybe you know, you, you just miss, but that the totality of the data may suggest that the product really is useful. I think you have to um, look at that as well. Um, but, but again, I, and, and where I worry with some of this is, you know, when you say we're going to pick one method and say this is our, our, um, our definition, is that, um, as I was saying earlier, there are methodological challenges and there are operational challenges for implementing some of these new things. Mm -hmm. And some of, the, the, some of those may, you know, you might, quote, fail your, your endpoint, not because the product isn't actually doing something, but because of the methodological challenges of getting the data to, to bring it in. And so I think these are all really things that kind of keep me up at night when I'm thinking about these, these kind of trials. So that is, again, a very good segue to, to the next topic. And we do have a question from William Snow on, on, the, on the table here, which we will weave into this next topic as we start discussing it. So we know that antiretrovirals work. Uh, we have used them for treatment uh, for decades now. They suppress viral replication. We know that we can prevent mother to child transmission. We know that we now have two drug classes that have demonstrated that they are effective in prevention. We've learned a lot about the PKPD dynamics of, of how this does work in prevention. And so you mentioned totality of evidence, Mike. So when we think about this background evidence we have, I'd like to go back to you, Jeremy, when you talk about equipoise and the science having to be sound. If you have this, all this information about what an antiretroviral does and how it behaves in, in a body uh, of someone who, who either has HIV or is being exposed to HIV, how do you weave that into your thoughts on equipoise and uh, sound science? Great, so, so great question and great question from Bill Snow as well. Um, I think the, the issue here is we're not talking about equipoise, we're talking about clinical equipoise, right? So. 
Um, equipoise is what an individual holds and clinical equipoise is what the community of people who, who know about the issues and can evaluate the evidence think. And, and so if you think about equipoise alone, everybody, probably everybody that's on this panel and everybody who's listening in knows what's gonna work, why it's gonna work, they're gonna think it's gonna work and we're usually wrong in clinical trials. So clinical equipoise is when we're divided as a community and those are uh, when we can take it on. We don't, we don't mm -hmm. hit the proverbial home run uh, most of the time, unfortunately. Otherwise, the New England Journal and the Lancet would be full of all of our papers um, all the time. Um, I think the real question to ask here is, yes, we know a lot about antiretroviral uh, treatments. We know about their use in prevention and treatment. We know that um, they can be effective in prevention, and that's just been stunning. I mean, just the, 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 it, it's been stunning. And there is a preponderance of evidence that they, the class, works. We don't know whether this or the proposed agent works. So yes, I, I totally agree with Grace. It's exciting to hear about these opportunities, but we got to hear about why are we doing these trials in the first place? So do we need another oral prep agent? Do we need another injectable prep agent? Do we know, need alternate methods of delivery to um, increase adherence or compliance? And so the question is in the broad class of agents. Yes, we, with the zeitgeist is, we believe this. We, we have we have drank the proverbial Kool-Aid. We know it works. We have scientific evidence that the class can work in certain ways in certain populations, but each agent is different and can perform in different ways. And that's precisely why we need a science. So going forward, the question is gonna be, was what, what niche is this new agent gonna to bring to the prevention toolbox or the mosaic? And if there's a, a potential niche that they're gonna fill, and people need alternative medications to treat the same issue. People need preventive options. But in the antiretroviral space, we have to ask um, engaged is what could this, if it's a win, or at least if it's equal, performs as well, what's it gonna do for us and evaluate it on its own merits? Because just because one works in one way, it could do surprising things um, in another. And so that's the caution going forward. Did oh. I answer or evade it? Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Grace, let me ask you to um, to jump in here and respond to Jeremy on on this issue of why are we doing these trials from your perspective, and and how does the the preponderance of evidence of knowing how antiretrovirals work affect you and your thinking about the validity of these trials? Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, Jeremy, for the thoughts uh, and, and, and ideas uh, brought in the conversation. I think from a community's perspective, uh, there are two issues. And I think I loved his input to say, what is each option or each intervention bringing on the table? And I think that's a conversation that as communities, we also discuss and we also want to have. Because it's not just about adding uh, prevention tools to the toolbox, it's also making those options that are being added to be of quality and to respond to the needs of the community. Because as a woman, I need to be able to choose something that works for me. In the same way, the way the contraceptive field has worked uh, for the past few years. So what we are asking for as communities is, as we are designing these interventions, we want interventions or we want results actually, that speaks to the needs of communities that speak to the needs of women that are most affected, key populations that are most affected. I need to be able to walk in and say, okay, I can't choose oral prep. What else is there that I can use of quality? And for mm -hmm. us to get there, it's these conversations we're having right now. How do we get these questions answered around the tools that could be made available in the future? So for us as communities, we really are keen on this conversation, but beyond that to say, what next? After we have all this conversation, after we have these discussions, what happens next? When do we start seeing the practicalities of all these discussions that we're having right now? Because at the end of the day, I want to be able to go to my community and communicate this in the most practical sense as much as possible, beyond just uh, the, the, the conversations, because they will ask us, okay, what does this really mean for us? And we want to be able to give them tangible solutions and tangible answers. So I think I would respond like that. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, that's a very good um, segue now also to the next question. I wanted to address Bill Snow's question and maybe going back to you, Sheena, 
uh, reflecting on what Grace said and the and the question from Will Snow has disappeared off of my screen, but it was about individual versus public health benefit. And when do we start thinking more along those lines? So ju just to, to say, I was thinking when Jeremy was speaking and Grace, that one of the things we always want to know is the relative safety profile. That's mm -hmm. really key. And, and I think it's a very clear reason why you want to, might want to get something new in the clinic because it, it's, it's more, it's safer, but also uh, uh, as Grace was saying, something people really want to use as a demand for it. Um, so, so those are two uh, things that are not related to efficacy, but which are really important to, mm -hmm. to, to people to know. So when do you start moving? I, you know, that is a, a really tricky question. And, and one of the things uh, you know, I've been thinking about uh, a lot as we see HIV rates go down and down and down with test and treat and PrEP is does there come a time when there's more risk from the PrEP than there is from the benefit? And how on earth are we gonna work that? Out? I mean, it's a great problem to have, but how are we ever gonna work that out? So, um, so yeah, thinking of the, the public health side of it and, and thinking of the public <clears throat> personal prevention, um, and where that money might be better spent, we may eventually get to the, to, to the setting in some communities where we've done such a great job, we, we can stay on top of it with test and treat and very little prep. Um, mm -hmm. That's not really what you asked me, but I just wanted to be provocative and throw that in there. That's, no, that's very good. So let me uh, bring that question back to David and thinking about, you know, we're decreasing um, incidents as Sheila, men Sheila mentioned, but do we still see pockets where this is not happening? So when we look at overall numbers, we might see decreases, but in San Francisco has done a great job as a city and as a county to, to really uh, reduce incidents. But do you think that we still need to really worry about pockets of, of incidents, high incidence rates that are not being really helped right now? I think we do. And I think our trials should be nimble that they are going, that we should be going to places and to uh, underserved. Right. We do right. have an effective product. And so it's gonna be about finding products that connect with places that are currently underserved. Right. So we could hear most of that. So you're talking about really needing to do the, these trials in these communities and be nimble enough to be able to find them. But I really like Sheena's challenge of, you know, will we get to a point, wouldn't that be nice? We get to a point where, the, where PrEP is riskier than, than no PrEP uh, because of the success we've had. And that of course is, you want, uh, want to comment more on that? To say that we we do that at the individual level, I think quite effectively now, where people are maybe running into some toxicity issue, and you're then balancing what's the risk of catching HIV at this moment in time for you, and 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 you know it, therefore is it sensible to carry on with daily prep, or should you be thinking about um, a, a more of an intermittent use of it? So we can do that for individuals, but public health mm -hmm. is the challenge. Right, right, right. So as we approach um, uh, the top of the hour here, let me ask Tamban, let's pull you back in here again. And so from what you have heard from the video presentations and the discussion today, are there any other approaches you think we should be thinking of that, that we haven't started to discuss yet to get at this problem? Well, yeah, I, I, th I think I agree with all of the speak, you know, all of the comments that you've been addressed. I, I think it's, it's a very challenging area. One thing I would like to go back to what Jeremy has mentioned, you know, and Mike also, I think we need to have a good science behind any kind of an external control. You know, whenever we deviate from the concurrent control to anything external, we need to have good science and also good statistical methods to be able to estimate it. It has to be reliable okay. because all these estimates could have various, uh, you know, bias and other things. So we need to have that. And secondly, I would think that we also need to have additional sensitivity analysis based on the incidence of previously enrolled studies, something in the recent past to be able to validate. So mm -hmm. I think that's what I would add to that. 
So sensitivity analysis and re really looking very carefully at the methodology, the statistical methodology of how we do these comparisons. Right, in the similar populations. It's very important right. that we are looking at the same population. So. Right, yeah. So, um, Mike, do you think uh, we need to have a plan for multiple approaches, um, at least two? And what would you think is the best way forward now in terms of what's available to us? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk about, you know, different things that we could do. Um, I think a lot of the, the work that's been summarized and some of the videos that we've talked about, the, the one that um, um, I think it seems like a lot of folks are, um, you know, kind of, you know, uh, coming towards is using um, recency assays to to estimate the background incidence rate. Um, again, there are methodologic challenges and operational challenges to make that work. That I think um, you know could be overcome, but they you know they shouldn't be minimized. If you had good surveillance data from the same communities, and I mean really the same communities where you're conducting the trials. That's obviously a, a, a great, great um, asset to have. And you think about some of the great data that we've had, for example, from the ECHO trial recently, mm -hmm. or even some of the other recently conducted trials, you know, like HPTN 083, we've, we've seen the results coming from that. We're soon, I, I hear we're gonna be getting results of the AMP trials, you know, so those, those studies may provide that evidence. But I think to Dave's point, uh, one of the challenges we're facing is that some of the communities which really are most in need where the incidents are, is we don't have that good surveillance data there, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, we can't just do our trials where we have good data, you know, that's looking like, like looking for your keys under the street light, because right. that's where you can see them. Um, so I think where we have that data, that would be great to have, but but we have to recognize that we don't have high quality data in many places that we would conduct the trials. I think, you know, Jared talked about using SDIs to, to estimate um, rates. And I think, again, that was a great idea. I think, you know, we all recognize the challenges now that uh, that correlation may not be as valid now as it once was, but certainly that would be a additional supportive data. So I guess I would say, I think you probably do need uh, multiple you know, uh, pieces of evidence that you would support. I think the recency assay um, approach is very promising. Good quality surveillance data where it exists is promising. And then I think you know, collecting data on the rates of STIs is another approach that we should be collecting, again, realizing the limitations that, that we have with okay. it. Good, and we're uh, uh, winding up here. There's a question about if we use an external placebo arm, would treatment arms require increased numbers of participants? And that of course is a very key question. And that's being very actively addressed by one of the forum working groups on how, how we could possibly use the cross-sectional incidence assay. So uh, we are working on that and I hope to have a, an answer soon in terms of, of what the trial size, the end would actually have to be. To wrap this up, let me go back to Deborah. You gave us such a very good introduction to this topic today. And maybe just reflect um, on your own journey as a, as a HPTN uh, clinical trialist, statistician. How has your journey been to kind of start feeling more comfortable with this idea of an external counterfactual placebo, uh, whichever words we want to put together in this string to describe that? Oh, that's a, I mean, I, I think um, I'm very proud of where we are at the moment. We have all these great products that have been done through randomized clinical trials, through these comparisons now moving on to non-inferiority and active control. Um, I, I do think we are at the end of a road here in terms of antiretroviral prevention and being able to see, you know, incontrovertible evidence with contemporaneous randomized controls. Um, it's very uncomfortable as a biostatistician to be looking at these alter these other alternatives. Um, and I, I um, it, it's, it's just a place where um, I, I do like the cross-sectional incidents. I think 
you know, anytime we're doing something new, there are risks associated with it. And I think um, really understanding and having this engagement with community and really good understanding about the risks we're facing is um, a very positive place to be. Um, I, I do think the the hope for me is that these antiretroviral um, approaches have been proven so effective that the gap between most counterfactual estimates, even though they may be flawed and they may be confounded, when we're looking at products that are in the range of you know, 75 to 90% effective, the drop from a group of people who are at risk for HIV and not using any prevention, which is what the counterfactual placebo is trying to get at through historical data or through um, even cross-sectional incidence data or registrational cohorts, the drop should be dramatic enough if the product works, that I'm thinking, I, I'm hopeful that the evidence would be convincing for both um, for both the proof that the product works and for the efficacy that, and for the people and policy makers who will be asked to pay for or want, you know, would then have the opportunity to use yet another um, successful prevention. So I, I think in a way, I'm hopeful that these new methodologies will work precisely because the tools may have the potential to be so good. Right. Well, that I wanted to finish with you uh, since you let us off at the beginning. And, um, and it's really interesting to see how different people from different backgrounds, um, you know, have to go through, through a process of really thinking about this. But let me hand it back to Roger and uh, to close up. And I really want to thank all of you for your very active participation today. It's been wonderful to have you. Back to you, Roger. Thank you, Ronika. Um, I would like to thank all our panelists who gave their time today, as well as all the attendees to this workshop. I would also like to draw your attention to similar and complementary work done by your colleague at the Forum for Collaborative Research, as well as our colleague at EVAC. We're all working towards building research literacy, which as Grace noted, is very important. Um, the, to, 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 to close, um, I would like to thank the organization with whom we have worked in partnership, the HBTN, the HBTN and the forum. And the organizing committee member, Deborah, Holly, Veronica, Stefan, Linda Gale, uh, another Holly, and, and, and uh, with whom we have spent many nights and many early morning working on this. And finally, drawing your attention to the next panel discussion on the 18th of November, we'll be talking about future design approach for trial of HIV vaccines. Uh, you should already have the link to register for that, but I will be chasing you. And if you want to watch the presentation, they are still available online on the enterprise website. And we welcome comments and questions ahead of time or on the current and past station at enterprise at iasociety.org. Thank you very much all and see you soon on the 18th of November. Goodbye.